Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again Richard Mayberry. Richard uh, is the publisher of U.S. and World Early Warning Report for Investors, and he has written several entry-level common sense books on the United States uh, economics, law, and history. And from my perspective, Richard is a, a most valued uh, historian, really, in helping people see how the past applies to the future and, and therefore helping us to, pre- to prepare as best we can uh, for the uncertainties of the future. But using history, uh, I think, is, is something that people don't do nearly enough of, and Richard has really focused a lot of his work on understanding the driving forces in history and, uh, and, and then applying them uh, to the world that we live in. Uh, so, uh, Rich, I re- want to thank you so much for being with me again. It's really great to have you. Oh, thanks, Jay. Uh, I always enjoy being here. You're doing such a great job of giving people a uh, non-approved uh, viewpoint of things. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, so uh, so well or so tremendously needed, and thank you. Well, it is. Um, uh, thanks to people like you and other guests that I have, they help me do that, I think, to, to a great extent. Um, so approved, in fact, that I believe we've had two of our guests uh, taken down from YouTube. So we must be doing something right, in, in effect, if uh, uh, we're saying something that somebody doesn't like in powerful places. So um, I don't know if it's, if it's in my best interest personally to do that, but nonetheless, truth, it seems, has to be spoken as far as I'm concerned. And we need to be free to go there and to try to understand, to apply history to the future, as you do. So uh, on page two of your last issue, the August issue, U.S. Uh, in World Earning Report, you stated, and I quote, I could be wrong, but it looks to me like America has arrived at a historic turning point, end of quote. And then you mentioned three crises, the rebellion against the swamp, the cyber war, and the new era of inflation. And uh, just to make a point, this is not a small issue. You compared it to a Mount St. Helens volcano. Uh, And then you said, and I quote again, it is not speculation or fear-mongering. When you stand back and view the big picture, which the mainstream press rarely does, you can clearly see that three crises are already well along, those three that you just mentioned. So, well, you lay the blame, really, for the precarious state that uh, America finds itself itself in now, directly at the feet of the politicians, not the people as a whole. And you, you talk about five first principles that allows one to analyze how politicians are impacting our lives in the, now and into the future. And I'd like you to just perhaps talk about those a little bit. The first, uh, you have the five first principles. The first of those, political power, and I quote, this is an ex, uh, a quote uh, from uh, Mao Zedong, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, end of quote. Uh, let you just, just comment on that one, and then maybe we can comment, you can comment briefly on some of the others as well. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, What set, separates government, meaning the politicians and the bureaucrats, from the rest of us is that they have the legal privilege of initiating the use of brute force on us. And that's what the federal government's 300,000 laws are all about. Um, the government, each with each of those laws, what the government is saying is you will obey or people with guns will come to your home and haul you away to prison. Mm-hmm. You, you feel that every year when you're doing your income taxes. You don't see the guns, but you know that if you don't buy what the government is selling, if you don't pay that tax, people with guns will haul you away to prison. Mm-hmm. And that's what government is. is a group of people who have that special privilege. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You refer in your letter to a, a video, I guess, that you that you were involved with or you made. Why does power corrupt? Is that right? And, and is that mm-hmm. something people can avail themselves to? Um, yeah, there's a uh, yeah a video, uh, and uh, all you have to do is Google "Why Does Power Corrupt" and mm-hmm. my name Mayberry M A Y B U R Y. Okay, uh, so people can avail themselves to that. It's uh, it's free and on the internet, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yes, it takes about all right. minutes. Okay, um, the a second first principle: government is not reason; it is an eloquence. It is not eloquence. It is force, which is what you just said. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful 
and a fearful master. And that is a quote attributed to George Washington. Would you like to comment further on that? Yeah, the American founders really understood this stuff. Uh, there, there are You won't find any politician anywhere in the world today that has studied political power and tried to neutralize it as much as the American founders did. They, they get my vote as the greatest political geniuses in all of world history because they understood what they were trying to do um, with the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They were trying to, as much as possible, neutralize political power because they understood that it corrupts anybody who has it. Mm -hmm. They were interested in uh, the people having a say in their government. And it's interesting, you know, there's a, a number of people that you would consider to be sort of on the left side of the political spectrum that are waking up to the dangers that is going on now. Joe Rogan, for one, I just happened to see one of his videos recently, and he was talking about this is the first country uh, in history, he said, that really set out to be governed by the people. Uh, do, you're the historian. Does that sound right to you? To an extent. Um, they wanted some popular uh, involvement, but... In those days, the number of people who were allowed to vote was very small. It was only like uh -huh. three three percent of the population was allowed to vote. So they understood that political power corrupts the ordinary person just like it does anybody else. And if you give that power to the ordinary person in the form of a vote or whatever else you do, he's going to be corrupted by it because that privilege of meddling in other people's lives is an evil thing. And uh, so they were very careful about making sure that the population did not have all that much um, control over the government. They didn't want anybody to have much control. If you look at, at the, their, in their personal relationships with each other, they didn't trust each other, with the possible exception of Madison and Jefferson, um, they really, really didn't like each other, mm -hmm. and they. But they knew that um, they had to do something about the fact that none of them could trust any others with political power, and that's what the Constitution is all about. It's mm -hmm. a list of rules that you know you can't break these rules. You cannot do uh, very much to the people or anybody else. That's mm -hmm. what the Constitution is all about. Their attempt to control each other mm -hmm. right exactly and of course this is something that the left side of the political spectrum especially and i'm not sure that the right isn't guilty of it as well but the idea that um they don't really want the republic and again uh, i believe that the word democracy doesn't appear in the constitution it was to be a republic and it was a republic so that you could keep so that you didn't have what you just talked about the mobocracy, some people will say a democracy becomes a mobocracy as soon as the 51% figures out that it can vote for themselves whatever they want, uh, then the 49% can go to hell, essentially. And, and right. so they set these things in place. All of these, all of these checks and balances the uh, founders put in place to keep the majority from murdering the minority. But it seems to me that's something that's lost on the public today. They don't understand the philosophy of our government, they really understood, as you're saying, they, they didn't trust each other, and they didn't trust the, uh, the nature of human beings in general, I guess. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, they were realists. They could look back in history, and they could uh -huh. see how governments had behaved all through history, and they realized that uh, you can't trust this organization. This, this institution is inherently corrupt. All right. Well, the third principle, the third first principle, and I quote, the history of liberty is a history of the limitation of government power, not the increase of it, end of quote. And that's attributed to Woodrow Wilson, which was kind of surprising to me, because if there is one person in our history, from what I, my limited understanding of, his, of our American history, was that Woodrow Wilson was the one that sort of pushed a democracy away from the a Republican form of government. He wanted... He was considered to be a progressive at that time, and it was this sort of power to the people or the mass, the power for the individuals. And in fact, didn't we? Wasn't one of the slogans of World War One making the world safe for democracy, Richard? 
Yeah, that's right. Um, and you're right about Wilson. Uh, it is a mystery why he would come out with that piece of truth. Um, but he did. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to get hold of truth wherever I can find it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, every once in a while, even the worst of them, even the worst of the power junkies, will say something that's very instructive. Yeah. So the history of liberty is a history of the limitation of government power, not the increase of it. And uh, which way is that going now, Rick? Oh, my gosh. Like I said, the federal government alone. This is not the state and local government. It's just the federal government has made up 300,000 laws. And uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse. It's up to you. It's your responsibility, according to those people, to know what the laws are and to know which ones apply to you and what you have to do to obey them. 300,000 laws. Yeah, and in, in, the, in your discussion of the third uh, first principle, you talk about the importance of military and police, that the military and police don't really take an oath to obey their superiors. Uh, they take an oath to obey the Constitution. And this is an inc- incredibly important point, because if, uh, if the people in the military and the police, uh, you know, the police establishment uh, figures out that they don't need to pay attention to the Constitution. They can just simply follow the dictates of their superiors. Uh, which way do you think that's going in America now? Well, um, you know, I was I was in the Air Force. I was in a special operations squadron, and and this is in the 1960s. And the military at that time was already very very unhappy with the civilian leadership. And uh, a lot of the, even the career people would openly talk about uh, how crooked all of the uh, Congress and the, the White House were. And I am quite sure that <laughs> as bad as it was then, it's probably worse now. They may be keeping it secret. But, um, you know, a one, one very <laughs> recent thing here that's, that's been going on is they they sent I don't know how many guys and, or men and women to Afghanistan to die uh, for some uh, cause that was never really where, where figured out very well. Now all these people have died, and now they're going to leave Afghanistan, just walk away. So essentially, these people died for nothing. And you can bet that uh, when nobody's listening, an awful lot of those troops are having conversations about this mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Another very interesting uh, tidbit under this discussion of the third of the, of the third first principle has to do with the makeup of women and their attitudes. And this, I know, Rick, I know you're not a sexist, but this may come off to some people as if you are. But the idea that that women uh, in they tend to look at things a little differently. Um, and so they tend to be sort of touchy feely, I suppose you might say. Um, would you care to comment on that and and what impact it might have? Uh, yeah, um, I, I sure wouldn't use that terminology, touchy feely. You know, women, <laughs> in, in in my experience at least, and I think any psychologist would tell you, are are more uh, are less oriented toward following orders and more oriented toward caring about individuals and helping individuals. Uh And and when a woman is faced with having to choose between following orders or doing what's best for individuals in need, the Mm -hmm. woman will usually go in the direction of helping the individual. Uh Um, Okay, I think that's well established in in psychology. Mm -hmm. Well, now, you know, almost... uh, Let's see, it's 19%, I believe, of the U.S. military is women. Mm -hmm. And and I have a suspicion uh, that there are a great many of them that are feeling worse and worse about the direction the U.S. government is headed, especially in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And this idea of just going out and killing people just because they're ordered to, I would imagine that it is not going over with the women very easily. And, mm-hmm. and also, the, also the men, of course, mm-hmm. there are a lot of men that feel bad about it. But mm-hmm. the women, I think, especially, and a lot of those women are officers. They have influence. And I think they will be a, a big um, influence on the direction that this, this whole rebellion against the federal government goes. 
Hmm, very interesting. So it could be perhaps a positive impact. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I, I think that's that's very, very true. Um, and, I, and I think um, not only in foreign policy, but also you know, domestically, the day is probably coming when uh, the politicians are going to ask the military to protect them from the uh, angry uh, population. And uh, those women are going to have a lot to say about, well, whose side are we going to be on, the politicians or the ordinary person? Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, also, so the issue, it's very important which way, how the military looks at things. And, uh, uh, you know, it's been my my belief, Richard, that the military is generally made up of of more conservative uh, folks, people that are, are more aware of traditional values I may be wrong, and then maybe that's a, a, not a wise generalization, but that's sort of what I've felt in the past. I don't know what you think. Um, it certainly was when I was in um, forty years or fifty years ago. Geez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, and I think it it still holds. Um, yeah. Among other things, uh, you know, they do generally. There are exceptions, but they do generally have a very strong feeling of patriotism. And that necessarily draws you into uh, some knowledge of American history and why the country became the land of liberty and all of that. They generally will have more understanding of that than mm-hmm. the, uh, the average citizen does. So um, they, they're necessarily oriented in that sort of conservative direction. The, the liberals, my God, I mean, they just, they just hate... <laughs> I mean, they just hate this country. It's yeah. it's astounding. Again, there are some exceptions there, but um, they in the modern schools and colleges, you know, everybody's taught these days to believe that um, the uh, the American founders were terrible people and that they were in favor of slavery and all of this stuff. Um, it, it's such a misreading and a warping of what really was going on back in those days. But I think the military has a little bit better appreciation of it. And um, I'm kind of optimistic. Um, you know, when I went in, um, was, which was during the Vietnam War, the, um, the typical um, career person was, was one who was just going to follow orders. That was it. They trusted the government. Well, man, they don't trust the government anymore because nobody trusts the government anymore. And so they're kind of on their own about what direction that they think the country ought to go. Um, And um, I would suspect that at least half of them are mighty skeptical about uh, getting into one foreign war after another. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, you know, I I think, and I, I have no way to prove this, but I think that the military is going to be a key factor in what's coming in the future because those politicians are going to be giving them orders and their generals are going to be saying, I don't think the troops are going to go for this. Mm-hmm. All right. We're just a few minutes left yet. I, it's always, it always goes too fast with you, Richard. But here's the, the fourth first principle, quote, um, if I knew for a fact that someone is, uh, is coming to my house, with the conscious design of doing me good, I should run for my life, end of quote. Henry David Thoreau. It sounds a little bit like what Ronald Reagan says. If the government comes to uh, uh, tells you that they're here to help you, well, you better look out. Uh, yep. Can you talk a little bit about the dangers of looking to government for help? Well, the thing to keep in mind is that those people, in, well, back up even a little more, the government is made up of Ordinary human beings, people just like you and me, and they're trying to create laws and regulations and taxes, and they're trying to grow the government in a direction that they think is good for you and me. Mm-hmm. Well, come on, you know, they don't know you and me. They don't even know right. our names, and, and each individual is different. We all have a different yeah. mix of needs, wants, and desires. So these people in Washington who keep passing these laws are are trying to run our lives without really knowing anything about us. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that can't go any place but but wrong, you know, yeah. um, and that's what's going on in America today. You have all of these power junkies in Washington and in the state capitals and the local uh, uh, local capitals that are making up these laws, thinking they know what's good for you and me. I mean, this is insane. My God, this yeah. is just insane. Right. And right. and so you know, it the whole country is starting to come unglued. Things are breaking down all over the place because these people are trying to meddle in our lives. Right. Well, so which really leads me to the uh, to the fifth of these first principles, and I quote: "Politics as a practice, whatever its professions, has always been the systemic organization of hatreds." End of quote by Henry Brooke Adams, a historian. And I think you just kind of, I mean, have you? Can you remember a time in which Americans were? hating each other as much as, as, as we seem to be now? Uh, no. Um, I kind of suspect that even during the Civil War, it wasn't this bad as far as, as the hatred of each other is concerned. Mm-hmm. I really don't think Southerners and Northerners really hated each other. They just bought into the federal government's propaganda. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, today, there's also the propaganda. Um the pitting the the conservatives against the liberals or the progressives, whatever you call them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's there's something very visceral now. The uh, there is a a direct hatred of people who are on the other side, whoever they might yeah. be. Yeah. Uh, and 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 it's 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 a logical thing. You would expect it to happen. You have. Uh, one side of the political spectrum just wants to tax and regulate us to death and to take that money and to give it away uh, in order to buy votes. And the people who are being taxed for that, um, in some cases very, very heavily, are are just going nuts. I mean, they don't want to be terrorized by the tax collectors anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rick, you know, we're, we're really running out of time here. I know there's so much more to talk about. Inflation is an issue that you see approaching as a result of a lot of these policies that are being gone. You know, we are asked to wear our face masks, to pay your taxes, to do all kinds of things, except the people that are do, calling the shots seem to somehow uh, have another set of rules for themselves, a sort of encroachment that you talked about, inflation mm-hmm. being one of those encroachments. We just don't have time, but what I would suggest um, people should go to, I guess if you just uh, Google Richard Mayberry, you can get your uh, the, the site to sign up for your letter. I People should really sign up for Rick's letter. It's very reasonably priced, very low-priced letter, monthly letter, and it will really help you to prepare because, Rick, what I wanted to get to and we didn't have time was mm-hmm. how can people prepare. Use this information to best prepare for the future, and you have some very, uh, you know, very concrete ideas in your letter that people should really sign up for. So where can they go to sign up, and where should they go? Um, Our website is earlywarningreport.com. You can also look up Richard Mayberry, richardjmayberry.com. And uh, incidentally, the the issue you're talking about, August, that has the the lengthy article about the great eruption that's on us now, Um, you'll get that free if you uh, sign up uh, uh, within the next uh, week or so. Excellent. Well, people, you should do that. Go out there and don't hesitate. Do it right away. Rick, thank you so much for being with us, and I'm sorry we didn't have more time to talk about some of the solutions, but people can get them in your newsletter, so that's what they should do. All right. uh, Thank you very much. 